So we're going to continue now with water. Again, this is the second part of the first lecture. We'll call this lecture 1b. We're going to pick up right where we left off before. Now that we understand water's polarity and that it has partial charges, partial negative charge on the oxygen end and partial positive charge on the hydrogen end, we're going to hit on this idea of water being a universal solvent. So we've already talked about polarity. In this lecture, we'll get at the notion of a universal solvent, and we'll also tie that into the ideas and notions of things being hydrophilic or water-loving, and things being hydrophobic or water-hating. Uh, and then the last two chunks of this lecture will focus on other non-covalent bonds, such as van der Waals interactions and acids and bases. So water is typically referred to, at least by chemists, as the universal solvent. Many, many things can dissolve in water. Far more things can dissolve in water as dissolve in any other solvent. And again, because life evolved in the oceans, Everything that's important to life, by definition, dissolves in water because we are bags of water and because life started in water, life started in the oceans. So when we're concerned with the life sciences and biochemistry in particular, water is not only the universal solvent, water is often the only solvent we're interested in because all of the reactions that occur in our bodies are occurring in water. Polar molecules other than water Anything with charge, either full ionic charges or the kind of partial charges that we've already discussed, can dissolve in water. I like to think of this as water speaks a language, and the language that water speaks is the language of polarity. So anything that speaks the same polarity language can dissolve in water. Anything that doesn't speak that language of charge, positive charge, negative charge, partial or full, Anything that doesn't speak that language of charge can't interact with water favorably and therefore can't dissolve in water. When you put table salt, sodium chloride, in water, we all know that eventually that will dissolve. If you heat that water, it dissolves more quickly. If you just leave it on a windowsill, it dissolves slowly. But salt dissolves in water. What oftentimes gets lost is the mechanism by which that happens. How is salt dissolved by water? Well, what's really going on there, biochemically, is that that sodium chloride ionic interaction is being literally picked apart, atom by atom, ion by ion by water. So here we have it. In the center, we see sodium chloride, salt. And as we sh I'm sure we already know, sodium is a positively charged ion, chloride is a negatively charged ion, and salt is an ionic structure. It's an ionic interaction, no covalent bonds. So when you drop solid sodium chloride, solid salt, into water, water sees a chloride ion, any chloride ion, and says, hmm, chloride, negative. I speak that language of charge. And if you look at this diagram closely, what side of the water is interacting with that chloride ion? You'll notice it's the hydrogen face, or the partially positive face of water is interacting with negative chloride. Opposites attract. And those water molecules will slowly, eventually, nudge and pull and grapple and grab and completely liberate that chloride ion from the rest of the solid table salt. And it will form a shell, a hydration shell, a water shell around those chloride ions. And once that single chloride ion is encapsulated by water, to us it becomes invisible. It is dissolved. It's like it's gone because water is coating it. Now, there's also sodium in this table salt. And if sodium is there, water says, mmm, sodium, positively charged. I speak that language. But look at how the diagram shows water interacting with sodium. It's the negative oxygen face of water that's interacting with sodium. So we also have a hydration shell, a water shell around sodium. But that shell is inside out compared to the hydration shell around chloride because the negative oxygen sides of water are interacting with positive sodium. So each of these ions is being liberated and picked off of the solid table salt. Each of these ions is being encapsulated by water, but different faces of water are interacting with these ions depending on the charge of the ion. Negatively charged ions interact with the hydrogens of water, Positively charged ions interact with the oxygen of water. Opposites always attract. When each of these ions has finally been picked off the solid, and each of these individual ions is wrapped in a hydration shell of water, 
that salt will have completely dissolved and will be invisible to the naked eye. Pretty cool. Whenever we say that something dissolves in a solvent, this is what's going on. Molecules of the liquid, molecules of the solvent, are encapsulating individual atoms or molecules of the solvent, of the solute. Uh, and when that encapsulation occurs to completion, that molecule is completely dissolved. So again, remember these terms of hydration, shell, and being encapsulated by water. So anything that's polar, again, anything that has charge, that's a partial charge or a full charge, anything ionic can be dissolved in water. That molecule speaks this language of charge. We know that water speaks that language of charge. And so anything that has charge is also said to be hydrophilic. Water likes it. Anything that's negative, water likes with its hydrogen side. And anything that's positive, water likes with its negative side. Water likes these things and will dissolve them. For the most part, in biochemical reactions at least, hydrophilic things are good. Hydrophilic things coexist happily in water, they dissolve in water, chemistry can occur in water. And so well, most of the things we'll talk about in this course tend to be hydrophilic. Anything nonpolar, that is any molecule that has no charge at all, does not share this language of charge with water, is hydrophobic. Water doesn't know how to interact with things with no charge. The only mechanism water has by which it can interact with things is through charge. And so a completely uncharged molecule, like carbon dioxide, just can't happily coexist in water, won't be dissolved by water. Hydration shells won't form around it. And of course, as you know, hydrophobic as a term captures that. Hydrophobic things are water fearing, water avoiding, water hating. Water hates these things. Usually hydrophobic things are not good for biochemistry, because if you can't exist in water, you can't exist in us. And if you can't exist in us, you're certainly not promoting life. Hydrophobic molecules can often be hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are literally just that, hydrogens and carbons in a single molecule. Here's an example of a molecule that's largely a hydrocarbon. This is a nonpolar tail of a fatty acid. We'll talk about fatty acids much later in the course. But this is the tail of that molecule. And you can see it's made up of carbon with hydrogens, carbon with hydrogens, carbon with hydrogens. No electronegative molecules in there. Atoms, I don't see any oxygens. I don't see any nitrogens. I don't see any big little pluses or big little minuses. I see no charge of any kind. And so this is a nonpolar structure. Water cannot interact with this nonpolar tail, and it will not dissolve it. Fats are nonpolar. Oils are nonpolar. Lipids are nonpolar. When placed in water, any of these molecules will blob together and separate themselves from water. We know this if we deal with salad dressing. If you want to make a good salad dressing, you got to shake the heck out of it after you've made it to uh, make that emulsion, to get the water coexisting with the oil. And then you put that salad dressing bottle down. You wait 10 minutes, you come back. What happened? The oil and the water separated all on their own. You didn't have to put any energy into that system. Somehow, oil was segregated to the top and water was segregated to the bottom. Why does that happen? The main reason this happens is the idea of entropy. Entropy is the idea of chaos being a preferred state. The universe tends towards chaos is a favorite term or expression of chemists and physicists, and it's true. The more random and unordered a system is, the more the universe favors it. Randomness defeats all. The universe is in a constant quest to increase randomness. And again, this is the idea of entropy. Things that give off a high degree of entropy are favored. Things that absorb entropy or randomness are not favored. So we know water can interact with oil. Okay. So water does the only thing it can do. It corrals this unknown beast of oil. This molecule that it can interact with, it corrals it. In other words, water molecules make hydrogen bonds with water molecules and form a ring around the nonpolar molecule. This isn't a hydration shell. A hydration shell is when water is electrostatically interacting with the thing it's dissolving. Here, the water is not interacting with the oil. It's just forming a ring of water around it. So water is holding hands through hydrogen bonds, making a ring around this glob of oil. Just as we see here, these gray structures are nonpolar. You'll see nowhere are there interactions between water and these nonpolar molecules. 
Instead, water is organizing itself around this nonpolar thing, forming rings around it, corralling it, just because it doesn't know what else to do. So it just forms a ring around it. Now, I told you, water is organizing itself around this nonpolar stuff. Well, that's not good, because I just told you that entropy defeats all. Randomness is what we're after. So if water is being organized, if water is taking on an ordered structure, that's not good for the universe. The universe hates that, and that has to stop. So what happens is the water corrals the oil together more and more, increasing these globules to get the fewest number of organized water molecules possible. Let's take a look at this example. Here are two globs of oil, and we see the water is organizing around that oil because that's all it knows how to do. How many water molecules in total are organized on the left? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen ordered water molecules. Universe hates that. That's very against entropy. So water corrals or brings these two oil globules together, smushes them into one. And now let's see how many ordered water molecules are needed to form a ring around this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I don't think I counted this guy. That's nine water molecules. Now, those are nine ordered water molecules. The universe hates that. But over here, it was 14. So the universe prefers this state to this state. I'd much rather have nine ordered water molecules than 14. And those remaining five water molecules that we see here and here, they're now free from the ring. And they get to dance and play do-si-do -do and exchange hands and move around randomly all they want. They get to play. And the universe likes that because it's random. It's chaotic. And that's what the universe was after. So it turns out that the state or status that has the least number of ordered water molecules is when all of the oil is completely corralled on top of the water and the water gets to lie below it. In fact, the only ordered water we would ever see in this structure is the water that lies at the molecular interface between the, water, the oil on top and the water on the bottom. All of the rest of the water throughout this beaker is free to dance and be as chaotic as the universe wants it to be. So oil and water separate on their own with no additional energy needed because that separation, that segregation, increases entropy. It frees up the largest number of water molecules to be chaotic, and the universe wants that to happen. So it's a spontaneous process. It's a good thing to have randomness from the universe's perspective, and so it's a good thing for oil to be corralled. So we've kind of gotten around to the idea of hydrophobicity here without even clarifying or defining it. This tendency of hydrophobic molecules to cluster together because they're being corralled by water is what we mean by a hydrophobic interaction. Ooh, and I hate that word. Because a hydrophobic interaction is not an interaction at all. Hydrophobic interactions are not interactions. Uh, hydro, the hydrogen bond is an interaction. Two things are engaging with one another. Positive charge on one side, negative charge on the other. They attract. Covalent bonds are interactions. They're shared electrons between two atoms. Whenever we say interaction, we think that, oh, I don't know, things are interacting. But such is not the case for hydrophobic interactions. The hydrophobic molecules have no affinity for one another at all, and there's no interaction occurring between them of any kind. Instead, hydrophobic inter interactions are simply nonpolar things that are being squished together because water is corralling them. In other words, they're trying to get away from water, and water is trying to increase its entropy, and so these non -hydro these nonpolar hydrophobic things are being brought together. The analogy I think of with this is a little bit of World War II history. In the later stages of World War II, Russia, Soviet Russia, and the United States were actually allies. We were fighting on the same side, but we were not friends. We did not like Russia in World War II, and Russia did not like us. But 
The United States was terrified that Nazi Germany would win that war and achieve world domination. And Russia hated and feared the Nazis just as we did. And so Russia and the U.S. got together as allies in their shared and mutual disdain for Nazi Germany. That's why the U.S. and Russia were allies. Not because they liked each other, but because they equally hated Germany. They had a common enemy. And we can think of water as that Nazi Germany example. Water is the common enemy of hydrophobic molecules. So hydrophobic molecules will get together and tolerate one another in their mutual dislike for water. Hydrophobic things are the U.S. and Russia. They don't like each other. They're not interacting with each other. But they will come together in their mutual repulsion from water. Let's close this out by talking about amphipathic molecules. This is a small family of molecules that have both polar and nonpolar properties. Amphipathic molecules contain polar regions and nonpolar regions on the same molecule. So here's an example of an amphipathic molecule. We see these hydrocarbon chains again. We've already said these are nonpolar. Anything that has nothing but carbons and hydrogens in it has no charge at all. And without charge, they have no polar interactions at all. So this is a nonpolar region of the molecule. But on the other end of this molecule, at the head, look what we see. We see nitrogen, which we know is electronegative. We actually see nitrogen involved in a full charge. Here we have a full positive charge up here. And we also have oxygen, which is also electronegative, and oxygen carrying a full negative charge. Water loves this. This speaks the language of charge. Water hates this. This is completely nonpolar. And so we have an amphipathic molecule here. We have a molecule that has something water does like at its top or one end, and something that water doesn't like on its other end. Drop this molecule in water, and it does something amazing. It forms a structure like this, a micelle. Micelles are molecules that are structures that are formed by molecules that are amphipathic. And the way that micelles form is that the polar head groups say, hey, water, I speak your language, you speak mine, let's dance. And water interacts with those hydrophilic head groups that have charge. The hydrophobic tails, they go rushing towards the center of the micelle where water can be excluded. So they fill in the internal hollow of this ball, uh, and they shield themselves from water. So water never has to form a ring around these things, which is good, because we don't lose any entropy. And these things don't have to be around water, which they hate, which is good as well. So we have a ball that forms. And it's important that you realize that what's being shown here is a cross-section. It's not a circle that forms. It is a ball. So think of this as a tennis ball that has been cut down the center, and we're now looking into it in cross-section. The shell of that tennis ball is nothing but hydrophilic head groups and the inside of that tennis ball is made up of the hydrophobic tails. Amphipathic molecules are also important for us in another way. Soaps, detergents are amphipathic molecules. Man oh man this looks like a good breakfast. A little bit disgusting being half eaten like that but it looks like it was yummy and I see a lot of yummy grease on that plate. Run that plate under hot water and guess what's gonna happen? Nothing, because that grease is hydrophobic, and simply running warm water over it isn't going to do squat. If you want to get that plate clean, you better use some soap, and soap is amphipathic. The grease on that plate is hydrophobic. It's made up of oil, and so that grease will only interact favorably with other hydrophobic nonpolar things. Well, soap has that to offer because it's amphipathic. The nonpolar tails, those tail groups, will interact very well with that greasy oil. Because hydrophobic things will interact with hydrophobic things. The enemy of their enemy is their friend. But on the other end of that soap are hydrophobic, hydrophilic head groups, excuse me. And so each of these greasy, oily globules will actually form the center of a sphere where the hydrophobic tail groups of amphipathic molecules will coat the oil itself, leaving the hydrophilic head groups on the outside to interact favorably with what? With water. And so water can then dissolve or form a hydration shell around these amphipathic head groups that have at their center oil. So you soap up the plate, you get all of those 
my cells to form with oil at their center. You run that plate under warm water now, and all that oil runs right off, coated in water, coated in detergent. And so soap works to solubilize grease by forming shells of detergent molecules around that grease that water can then favorably interact with. So in the end, these oily, soapy micelles behave as all micelles do, and they can be fully hydrated, fully coated and encapsulated by water, and then down the drain they go. So let's wrap up here by switching gears uh, very quickly, and we'll talk about van der Waals interactions. Van der Waals interactions are not hydrogen bonds, and they do not require electronegativity, but some similarities lie between the two. First off, van der Waals interactions are non-covalent. Uh, they are weak interactions, and they're also referred to sometimes as induced dipole-dipole interactions. Keep in mind your very general chemistry. Each atom is actually made up of two large component parts. It has a positive nucleus made up of protons, and that nucleus is being orbited by negative electrons. So this is your classic example of an atom. Positive in the center, negative on its shell. If you were to bring two atoms close together, you would imagine that the negative electron cloud of one atom would repel the negative electron cloud of the next atom. There's a repulsion of those electron clouds. Makes sense, and that occurs. If you continue, however, to bring these atoms close together, one electron shell or cloud will literally push the electrons of the other atom completely out of the way, completely to the other side of that atom. Exposing what? Exposing the nucleus, which is positively charged. And now we have an electron cloud of the first atom able to interact with the exposed positive proton nucleus of the second atom, and we can get an opposite attraction interaction. The positive exposed nucleus of one atom interacting with the negative electron cloud of the other. This animation shows it very nicely. We'll watch this for a few cycles. We have two Ne atoms coming close together. I'm not familiar enough with my um, periodic table to tell you what Ne is, but it's just any old atom. And we can see normally when these start, there's a very orderly and um, equal distribution of electrons around the cloud of these atoms. But then as we draw these atoms together, we'll see that the electrons here start pushing against the electrons here. So the electrons on this atom get pushed all the way to the left side. That exposes the nucleus. And the nucleus, of course, is positively charged. Because these electrons were doing the pushing, we have a negative charge here, a partial negative charge here. And now this partial negative charge can interact with this exposed positive nucleus of the neighboring atom, and we have a van der Waals interaction. We have an attractive force between these two. Now, if we keep squeezing these atoms together, and we keep pushing them together, eventually the nuclei themselves will repel. The positive nuclei of one will repel the negative nuclei of the other. There's no nuclei cloud, and so those protons can't go anywhere, and they'll repulse. Additionally, if we have very large distances between these atoms, we can't make the electron cloud of one push on the other, and so we won't have a van der Waals interaction there as well. But at this magical distance, where these atoms are just close enough for these electrons to push on these electrons, but just far enough that the protons are not repelling, we get this attractive force. We get a van der Waals interaction. What I've just said in words is summarized very nicely in this uh, figure from your textbook. Here we have the energy of attraction. Repulsion is above zero, and attraction is below zero. And what we have on the x-axis here is the distance between the two atoms that we're considering. So let's say the distance is very, very far, very large distance between these atoms. Since there's a large distance, there's no interaction between the atoms at all. No repulsion, no attraction, no electron clouds pushing, really nothing happens. And we see that we have zero energy between the two. Uh, in other words, no attraction, no repulsion. The two atoms are completely naive to each other. 
And then we start shortening the distance between these two atoms, just as you see here. We start bringing those two atoms together. And as we bring them together, the electron cloud of one atom pushes away the electron cloud of the other, exposing the protons of the nucleus. And when that distance gets just right, those electrons of the first atom are attracted to the protons of the second atom, and we have a van der Waals interaction. Beautiful. We keep shortening that distance, though. We keep driving those atoms together. And eventually, we'll push them so close together that the nuclei are able to interact, and those positive protons of one nucleus strongly repel the positive protons of the other nucleus, and our energy goes from an attractive force to a very strong repulsive force, and those atoms will push off of each other and um, go back to not interacting at all. So van der Waals interactions are only capable at this magic window, this magic distance, where we're just close enough to have the electrons repelling, but still far enough that the protons are not repelling as well. Just like hydrogen bonds, just like Velcro, van der Waals interactions are very weak in and of themselves, but if you have lots and lots of van der Waals interactions all together in one place, you can have a very strong attractive force. This is an electron micrograph, uh, and a, a picture taken with an electron microscope. And I often in class, when I would give this lecture traditionally, offer $100 to any student who can guess what this is. Can't do that here because I'm sitting in my office and you're sitting at home. Uh, but I ask you, encourage you to take a moment and guess if you can... Um, see what this is here. You won't guess it, but go ahead and try. This is actually an electron micrograph of the bottom of a gecko's foot. A gecko is a small lizard that is known for being able to walk up walls and walk on ceilings. For the longest time, scientists believe that there was some kind of adhesive component that geckos made on their foot pads, like glue, like tape, and they would look for it, and they could never find it. They would take geckos and swab their feet, kill geckos and study their feet, and they couldn't figure out how the geckos were sticking to walls and hanging upside down with no adhesion. They even came up with crazy ideas, like the, whatever the adhesive molecule is, is squirted out very rapidly and then sucked back in by the foot, and so you can never catch it out at any one time. Turns out that what's on the gecko's feet is nothing more than these. These are large surface area uh, structures, almost like hairs, with, but large surface areas. And what's happening is the gecko is actually holding its foot at the magical van der Waals distance away from the surface it's climbing on. Because of the attractive force of those van der Waals interactions, all summed up by the trillions, there's enough force there to hold that gecko upside down. When the gecko needs to take a step forward, it literally peels its foot away from those van der Waals interactions. Remember, they're very weak, so the gecko just needs to pull just a bit, apply a little bit of foot force to pull its foot off of the ceiling or off of the wall, and then when it takes the next step, it holds that foot at the magic van der Waals interaction distance. All of those induced dipole-dipole -dipole interactions occur, all of those weak attractions occur, and there's enough force there to hold the gecko upside down once again. So it's incredible that the quote-unquote adhesive force that's keeping the gecko suspended on the wall is nothing more than trillions of van der Waals interactions made possible by these large surface area structures or hairs at the end of the gecko's foot. Science has since co-opted this, and we have made adhesive-less structures that can stick to walls and ceilings using the technology that we were able to learn from the gecko's foot. Pretty amazing. So what did we talk about in this lecture? We talked about, uh, in general, water being a polar molecule, but now in the context of it being the universal solvent. Things dissolve in water because anything with charge can interact with water. Water has a negative side and a positive side, and so any charge molecule can interact favorably, be hydrated, and encapsulated by water. Not true of nonpolar molecules, however. Nonpolar molecules are hydrophobic, and water cannot interact with them. So to increase entropy, water clusters them together. We talked about amphipathic molecules such as soap, which have one end that speaks the watery language and another end that doesn't. 
We need these molecules to do many things, but one of them is to dissolve fats. So soaps are amphipathic. Uh, fats can interact with the nonpolar side, water interacts with the polar side, and down the drain the fats go. And we ended talking about this amazing property of van der Waals interactions. Van der Waals interactions are induced to dipole interactions where the negative electron cloud of one atom pushes on the negative electron cloud of another, exposing the positive proton nucleus, and so now we can have a negative positive interaction that has been induced or forced by this magical distance of the van der Waals radii. So that's all we have for this unit. Uh, we'll be closing this out with the last two chunks of this lecture where we talk uh, a little bit about acids and bases and pHs and how water plays into those as well. Thanks for watching.